but I want to invite, if you'd put your hands together, this old preacher, old preacher, Randy Hurst. He's my age. Woo Thank you. I am as excited as a three-headed woodpecker to be back at New Hope, to be able to get 99-cent sloppy joes at Bebop's, which we don't have in Springfield, tragically. How many believe our steps are ordered of the Lord? That means you're not here by accident, I'm not here by accident. Let's invite God to do what he wants to do in and through our lives. Father, we thank you that we serve a God who speaks, who does not leave us in the dark, but has promised to guide us into all truth. I pray we would know your truth this morning, and your truth would make us free from anything that holds us back, from obedience to your divine purpose and very specific plan in and through each of our lives. We thank you in advance for what you're gonna do in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Actually, you can turn in your Bibles. Uh, I'll ask you not, Steve, don't put it up on the screen. I'm gonna see if you can quote the first part of our text from memory. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine, quote it with me. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now I'll quote the next verse. For, put it up on the screen, verse 10, Steve. Notice this, we are God's handiwork, or the New American Standard says workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Right after the Apostle Paul says we're not, we're very, he very clearly says we're not saved by good works. He turns right around and says we're saved for good works. Now the good works that we do do not pay back for the salvation that was a gift, amen? Not only are we saved by grace, which is a gift, salvation is a gift, the faith through which we receive it is a gift. He says that, the faith is not of yourselves, it's also a gift. But through that, then he created us to do good works, and he said he prepared them in advance. I want you to notice, by the way, and the New American Standard says, instead of it says for us to do, it says that we should walk in them. And I checked it in Greek. When I was here at Youth Pastor in Des Moines at First Assembly, I was asked by Open Bible College, they lost their Greek teacher, and so they asked me to teach Greek and hermeneutics. So I'll give you a little Greek lesson this morning. I always read the text in Greek. And in Greek, the Greek word translated do in the NIV is peripateo. Have you heard of the word peripatetic? It has to do with walking. And that's what it literally means. He says that we are to walk in the good works that he has prepared for us. That's why I asked you if you believe that our steps are ordered of the Lord. He has ordered our steps to do good works. And I, I have two principles I want to share with you this morning. First of all, about good works. This is the first principle. Every good work is recorded. Recorded. Do you know no, ma no matter how small a thing it is, the Word of God says all of our good deeds, there's a book. I don't think it's a book with pages. It couldn't hold. How, you imagine how big that book would be? But it says every word, every deed is recorded in heaven. And so notice what he said earlier. They are recorded even before they happen. In Psalm 139, verse 16, David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, your eyes saw my unformed body. Now what he's saying is that before I was born, you saw me in my mother's womb, and elsewhere in that chapter, he said, you wove me together. The Hebrew word is sakak, like wove me like a piece of cloth. Do you know that God is at work in the life of an unborn child while it's in its mother's womb? How many of you believe that? God has a purpose and a plan for that child. You don't know when that child's in its mother's womb if it's gonna have musical ability or athletic ability, how their IQ is gonna be, but how many know that God is at work and has a plan and a purpose before that child ever takes its first breath? And he says, so you saw my unformed body, and listen to this, all the days ordained for me. 
Do you know that there are very, how many remember very great specific days that someone ministered to you in your life? You can think of a particular day. And you can think of days when God used you to minister to someone else. Do you know, we don't know the opportunities you're gonna have Monday morning to minister to someone, but God's word says this, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You see, the good works are not only recorded after we do them, my Bible says they're recorded before we do them, that in his book they were recorded. And I can look back at times, and you know that circumstances, how many know that people mess up and can obstruct God's purposes in our life, but do you know what? When we are surrendered to his lordship, that God will even circumvent the circumstances of other people's mistakes and the stupid things they do. And you know, when I was a very young person, when I was a teenager, I committed my life to Jesus to surrender to his lordship, and I said, Lord, I wanna always be obedient to your guidance in my life and to the works that you have planned for me and to walk in those steps. And I've seen miraculously how God reaches down and intervenes. Listen, when you make that consecration to God, God hears that promise, God hears that consecration, and he will work in special ways in your life. A number of years ago, I, I was flying to London to uh, preach at a, at a new church plant. It was called Calvary Charismatic Center. It had been planted by a church in Singapore where I was very involved in ministry. And uh, I had preached in this church in London the year before when it was brand new. And they met in a rented room in a basement. I didn't even remember where the street was. But anyway, the pastor in Singapore wrote the pastor in uh, London, told him I was gonna be going through there, and so they wanted me to come preach, and I preached that year, and I remember when I gave a salvation invitation, there were about 80 people in that church that morning, and when I gave an invitation, about, uh, I think it was eight exactly that came forward to receive Christ, 10% of those that were present there. Well, then I was scheduled again the next year to do that, and uh, on Saturday, before I was supposed to preach, and their service wasn't in the morning, it was one o'clock in the afternoon, because people had to travel from distances around London to get to the church. And so I called the pastor on Saturday. The phone rang, he answered, the, the voice answered, and I said, is this uh, Pastor Gabriel? And he said, no, he said, you have the wrong number. So he hung up, I thought, well, I must have misdialed, so I dialed it again. And uh, the same voice came on. I said, well, did you just receive this number recently? And he said, no, I've had it for 10 years. Don't bother me anymore. So he hung up the phone. Well, that was before I had my smartphone before I had international calling in my pocket, all I had was a little, pay, a little notebook that my secretary had filled out my itinerary and the things I had to do and the telephone number. And so, uh, and I found out later, and I'll tell you in a moment what happened, why I couldn't find Pastor Gabriel, but I couldn't call Singapore to find out where the church was, and I had no way of finding it. I looked in the phone directory, and the phone directory was more than a year old, so the church wasn't listed. So I gave up, and I knew it. Now listen, if I would have not shown up this morning, I guarantee you someone would have preached. It may have been Pastor Weaver, or he might have tapped someone else to do it. Someone would have preached, right? So I, sa I said to my wife, I said, well, honey, you know, I, I just can't find the church, so I'm sure someone's going to preach. And I said, but we're going to go to church. And, and uh, so I decided uh, that we would try to find a place I'd, I'd heard about, I thought it was called Kensington Tabernacle. But I couldn't find that either. So finally, I said to Ruth, I know a church we can find, Westminster Abbey. We will go to Westminster Abbey. And so, but anyway, but on Saturday, we went, and there were actually friends of ours that we met here in Des Moines who were youth pastors at Berean Assembly, Dean and Lita Anderson, and they had flown over the second week to be with us. They'd never been to England. And so we went out to Portobello Road in Kensington. That's a flea market, if you don't know what it is. And on the way back down, Dean Anderson said, Randy, what's the name of that church that you were uh, trying to find? I said, Calvary Charismatic Center. He said, no, the other one. I said, Kensington. He said, could it be Kensington Temple? I said, that's it, Kensington Temple. He said, look over there. And there through the trees, we could see Kensington Temple. Walked over to Kensington Temple. The bookstore was open. Found out there were several services in the morning. We decided we'd go to the 11 o'clock service. Next morning, went to 11 o'clock service. It was a large congregation, about 1,500. And there was no center aisle. And I like sitting down front. I'm used to sitting down front. So I was sitting about on the third row, right in the middle there. After this pastor preached, 
the worship leader got up and laid, led, had us all stand before he dismissed, led in one more worship chorus. Then I turned, was walking out the aisle to this side aisle, right like this, where I was gonna exit, and uh, Ruth and Dean and Lita were behind me, and I, my eyes just kind of fell on the back door, right in the center, and there was a guy standing alone in the back door, and our eyes met, and he went, and I went, and he went, and I, I, walked, I said, who are you? He said, my name is Frank. I said, where are you from, Frank? He said, I'm from Poland. I said, I've never been to Poland. How do you know me? He said, last year, you preach in Star Street. God really blessed my life. I said, Star Street. That's where charismatic, Calvary Charismatic Center is. I said, there, I'm supposed to be preaching there in half an hour. I said, do you know where it is? I'm on my way there right now. So I said to Ruth and Dean Lee, I said, listen, you guys can go to lunch. I'm going to preach. So I got with Frank. We got on the tube. Now, here's what had happened to Frank. Frank had never been to Kensington Temple in his life. He was early to church at Calvary Charismatic Center where I had preached a year before. He was hungry, he realized he was early. He got off at the next subway stop, which happened to be Kensington. Went up, found a little cafe, had some breakfast, was paying his bill for his breakfast, heard singing across the street, having never been to Kensington Temple in his life, walked across the street, stepped in the back door, just as the worship leader dismissed the service, and out of 1,500 people, his eyes fell on me in the middle of the crowd and recognized me, having only seen me once a year before. By the way, I asked Siri just to check. Do you know what the population of London is? 8,200,000 people. And out of 8,200,000 people, Frank happens to have breakfast across the street from where I am, where he can spot me out of 1,500 people. Are you with me? You think this is just chance? You think this is coincidence? You think this is good luck? Or are the steps of a righteous person ordered of the Lord? <laughs> By the way, you know why I couldn't find the church? My secretary in my little notebook had typed an eight instead of a zero in the telephone number. Only one digit wrong. Close doesn't count in telephone numbers. <laughs> close counts in horseshoes. You just, right? You just have to get closer than the other guy's horse. Horse, close counts in hand grenades. You don't have to hit the person, just get it close. Hello? Do you know, friends, God is bigger than a secretarial mistake when he has ordered your steps for a divine connection. And I got there, Pastor Gabriel, he was, I, they were already in worship time, and having worship, he was trying to throw a sermon together on the front row. He was so relieved to see me. And then when I got up to reach, I had prepared a sermon. But you know, a few days before, we had gone with Dean and Lita to Blenheim Palace. Blenheim Palace is where the Duke of Mar Dukes of Marlborough reside, and the palace was given by the king to the first Duke of Marlborough for winning a battle, and it's where Sir Winston Churchill was born. It's in that palace that Jack Hayford was inspired to write the worship chorus, Majesty, Worship is Majesty, a beautiful palace. And all of a sudden, in the middle of my message, I hadn't prepared it, I'd never talked about this before, I began to talk, I said, you know, I was at Blenheim Palace this week, and I looked at the beautiful architecture, and I thought of heaven, and I thought, you know what? Sir Christopher Wren, who was the architect of St. Paul's Cathedral, whoever designed Blenheim Palace or Buckingham Palace, I can't imagine the architecture of heaven. I started talking about the architecture of heaven. And I remember saying, get off this architecture kick. Hello? Pastor will tell you, sometimes the Lord will even almost unconsciously guide you to talk about something. I just realized it didn't explain in the first service why that was. But I'll explain it to you. You can tell anyone you see it was in first service why that happened, okay? Anyway, so I got back when I gave a salvation invitation. I gave an invitation for those who wanted prayer for other things, and I gave a salvation invitation. One dignified, well-dressed woman stood and came forward. I went and I said, have you known the Lord before? She said, I have never been to church in my life. I said, are you sure you understand the decision you're making? I always want to make sure a person 
and understands what they're doing when they make a decision to receive and follow Christ. And she said, I'm not sure I understand, but I really know I need to do this. Do you know you can't even fully understand and you can really know you need to do that? How many know that? And I said, well, I wanna make sure, her name was Eunice. I said, Eunice, I wanna make sure that you understand. So I'm gonna pray for these other people. I'm gonna ask Pastor Gabriel to explain to you what it means to receive and follow Christ and I'll come back and pray with you, okay? She said, yes. So I went down the line. I got down the line and down at the very end on the front row, there was this young Chinese guy and he was wired. He was going, Pastor, Pastor, come here. I came over and he said, do you know who that woman is? I said, of course I don't know who that woman is. He said, she is one of my professors at the university. I have been witnessing to her for months. I have invited her to church for months and she has refused to come. And I told her this Sunday, a guy is coming from America and he'll only be here one Sunday. Please come this Sunday. She said, I will come this one time, but don't ever ask me again. And I would have missed that divine appointment because my secretary typed an eight instead of a zero. But God is bigger than a secretarial mistake. He'll send Frank to have breakfast across the street from a church he's never, are you with me? Let me see your hands, I can't tell by your faces. And so, and I'll never forget when I took Eunice's hand, a leader in a prayer. And she prayed and she said, all of my life, she said, I have, she said I've never been to church all of my life I've walked around, here's how she described it, I've walked around in a spiritual fog that is thicker than any fog that's ever descended on London. But she said, now, she said, the light has shone through in my life. And I watched the light of God break on her face as I've seen it so many times when someone confesses their sin and prays and the Holy Spirit bears witness with their spirit that they're a child of God and no one has to tell them they're forgiven. God tells them they're forgiven. And may I, by the way, here's what I forgot to tell the first service. Anyone want to guess what she was a professor of? architecture yeah you got it hello are you with me listen God knows what he's doing God knows what he's doing and every good work is recorded even in advance quickly I want to share with you three principles of what I call God's mathematics he'll put it up on the screen do you know God's mathematics is not like our mathematics when we talk about every good work being recorded First of all, principle number one, God counts more than we do. In 2 Kings chapter six, do you remember Elisha's servant was so fearful because they were surrounded by their enemies and Elisha said, God, open his eyes. And God opened Elisha's servant's eyes and then he saw with chariots of fire all around them that by far there were far more with them than were against them. How many know God counts more than we do? Do you know that's even true in church? I remember a number of years ago, my district is, by the way, the Hawaii district. It used to be Iowa. Hey, if you had a choice, what would your district be? <laughs> Hello? No, it was not because of a choice. It's because I moved there many years ago. And you know, I was asked to do, preach a missions tour of the Hawaii district. It's a dirty job, but someone had to do it. And I preached a, a missions rally on each island, and Monday night, it was on what they call the big island, the island of Hawaii, in the city of Hilo, the little town of Hilo, I should say, in a hotel where they had rented a, a room for the rally, and there were 15 people showed up, I counted, and the missions director for the district said, Randy, I'm so sorry, you fl flew all the way here, and we only had 15 people show up, and I said, listen, I said, I have pe preached to three people in Pipestone, Minnesota, and I have preached to 75,000 in Seoul, Korea, anything between is a crowd, and you know, I had prepared a message on a call to ministry, a commitment to a divine call to ministry, but I thought, and I assumed so, it looked like it was just all pastors that had come. What I didn't know was there was young, one young couple that Pastor Albert Yasahara had brought with them, and Bob Barrows worked for Hawaiian Telephone, 
And when I gave the altar call, of course, ministers came forward. We had a great time of prayer. Two years later, I was at Hawaii District Council, and a big Hawaiian lady came up, threw her arms around me, said, I love you, Randy Hurst. I said, I love you too, whoever you are. And, I, and she said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no. She said, my name's Eileen Barros. And she said, do you remember preaching a missions service in Hilo two years ago? I said, yeah. She said, there weren't many people there. I said, 15. I counted. <laughs> she said, most of them were pastors. I said, I thought they were all pastors. She said, not my husband and me. She said, Bob and I were brought by our pastor. My husband worked for Hawaiian Telephone. And she said, that night, God called us to full-time ministry. We took a step of faith. Bob quit his job with Hawaiian Telephone. He started taking Berean courses, and by faith, we planted a church in the little town of Kamawela next to the Parker Ranch. And she said, in the last two years, we have planted two other churches out of that church. And she said, there are more than 200 people serving God who didn't know Jesus two years ago because you came and preached in that hotel that night, and God called us to the ministry. By the way, a few years ago, when I preached Hawaii District Council, and we ordained six people, four of those who were ordained for full-time ministry in that district came out of those churches that were planted by that young couple who received Jesus when they were only 15 in the service on a Monday night. May I tell you, God counts more than we do. Sunday school teacher, you're just teaching a class of a few kids. You have no idea what God wants to do through those kids' lives and multiply the gospel through those kids' lives because God counts more than we do. Second principle of God's mathematics, God counts less than we do. You remember Gideon? He was going against the Midianites. He thought he had 32,000, and he was still outnumbered by the Midianites. He thought he had 32,000 to fight the battle. God said, that's too many. Hello? God counts less than we do. He said, you tell anyone it's afraid to go. 22,000 took off. He's left with 10,000. He thought, well, at least I just got 10,000. Still got 10,000. God said, that's still too many. You with me? You know, we tend to count heads in church. God counts hearts in church. It's not about the body count, friends. And you know how God said, have them go drink at the river, and God narrowed it down to 300, and they won the battle with 300 because God counts less than we do. You know, a number of years ago, a few years ago, actually, it wasn't that long ago, I was invited in Amsterdam because I wrote a book on the Holy Spirit. It's been translated in Italian and in Dutch. And, and because it had circulated a lot in the Netherlands, they asked me to speak the 100th anniversary of Pentecost, 100th anniversary of the first person they know of in the Netherlands who experienced Holy Spirit baptism. And they rented the Olympic Stadium. Go ahead, Steve, and show that little Amsterdam clip, and I'll let you see. There were 25,000 gathered in the Olympic Stadium. And uh, I preached, of course, through an interpreter because because it was going into Dutch. You'll see the interpreter with me in just a minute. And of course, there's another crowd on this side you can't see from which side we'd taken uh, the picture. But anyway, it was an exciting day. But I have to tell you, those are virtually entirely believers, Pentecostal believers that came to that event. Well, that night, I went back. You can go ahead, uh, cut that off. I went back to the hotel that night, and uh, the, the uh, restaurant was closed at the hotel. And I needed to get something to eat, so I started wandering the dark streets, and I saw, uh, just around the corner from the hotel, a neon sign that said, pizza, pizza, you know, so I just felt led of the Lord, right, where that was, and <laughs> went into the place, and I went in, and it was on a counter, it was actually a bar there, and, and there was only one guy at the bar, and he was sitting there with a big mug of beer, he had a gray hair, long ponytail on his back and a handlebar mustache, sat down next to him. I said to the guy, I said, could you give me just one slice of pizza? He said, well, I've already turned the oven off. I don't have any pizza. I said, well, you know, I need something to eat. Do you have anything? He said, well, I've got a life, a loaf of, part of a loaf of bread. And he said, I've got some gyro meat that's left over. And he, I said, he said, I can make you a sandwich. I said, okay, that's good enough. So he's making me a sandwich. So I turned to the guy next to me. I said, my name's Randy. What's your name? He said, my name's Peter. 
I said, you don't sound like you're Dutch. He said, nah, I'm from Australia. I said, where are you from in Australia? Told me he was from Melbourne. I said, you know, I've been down in Melbourne. And we start talking a little bit. Then I asked him, I'm really cutting the conversation short. And I said, you know, Peter, I said, do you live near here? He said, yes. I said, do you attend a church anywhere? Now remember, this is Saturday night. He said, no, I don't attend church. I said, you know, tomorrow morning, I said, if you live near here, two blocks that direction, there are five streets come together, and there's a brick church there. And I said, he said, yeah, I've seen that. I said, I'd like to invite you to come to church tomorrow morning. And I said, now I'll tell you, it's a mission service. You may not know what that is. So they're going to be taking a missions offering at the end. But I said, you do not have to give anything in the offering because I am authorized to absolve you from giving anything in the offering. He said, really? I said, really? He said, why is that? He said, because I'm the, I said, because I'm the preacher. He said, you're a preacher? I said, yeah, I'm a preacher. He said, what are you doing in a bar? I said, well, I need to get something to eat, and that was a pizza sign. It's the only place I could get something to eat. And then, you know, when he found out I was a preacher, all of a sudden, he turned away. And you know, sometimes, pastor tell you this, when someone finds out you're a preacher, all of a sudden the conversation's over right? So I thought, boy, he doesn't want to talk to me anymore. And then after a minute, he turned back, and there were tears coming out of both Peter's eyes down his cheeks, and he turned to me, and he said, you know, I used to follow Jesus and serve him. And he said, but 25 years ago, he said, I was hurt in church. I stopped going to church I turned away from Jesus. I married a Dutch girl, moved to Amsterdam, started a painting business. And she said, he said, I'll never forget this. He said, you know, once you have followed Jesus, you'll never be happy if you're not following him. And he said, this morning I woke up and all of a sudden he said, I had a longing in my heart for Jesus. And I prayed. And I said, Jesus, I want to come back to you, but I don't know how. Please show me how I can come back to you. And he said, 10 o'clock at night, a preacher walks into a bar. <laughs> and I said, I said, Peter, would you come tomorrow morning to church? He said, yes, he would. And the next morning, it was during the worship time. I was standing down front here, and I kept looking over my shoulder both directions, and then during the worship time, he walked on that side, sat down right on the end of the pew, or the seats, and I got up and I preached, and we had the missions offering, we had prayer time, and he waited patiently, and I went and sat down with Peter and had the privilege of taking Peter's hand and leading him in a prayer to receive Jesus back into his life again. And the pastor emailed me weeks later and said, Peter's still attending church faithfully, still serving the Lord. And you saw a picture of 25,000 people. Yeah, it was an exciting service, but it was not as exciting as meeting Peter Weber in a bar and seeing him come back to Jesus. Why? Because God counts less than we do. And lastly, it's very simple. God counts differently than we do. You see, it's not about the numbers, it's about the heart. Do you remember in Mark chapter 12, I believe it is, where they were putting their offerings in the offering box? Some were undoubtedly putting in gold and silver because it just says large amounts. And then a woman came along and put in two mites. That's like two half pennies. One penny total. And Jesus said an amazing thing to the disciples. He did not say, she hath given a qualitatively more acceptable offering unto the Lord. He said, she gave more than all the rest. Now, how can you say a penny is worth more than gold and silver? <laughs> because God counts differently than we do. There's a second principle Remember the first one, every good work is what? Recorded. And number two, every good work is rewarded. Not only is it recorded, it is rewarded. In fact, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5.10. Paul says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things while done in the body, whether good or bad. But you know, folks, while we're going to be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ for eternity, may I contend to you that good deeds are not only rewarded in the next life, rewarded in the next life, they're rewarded in this life. You know, your pastor gets rewarded whenever he sees someone that grew up in this church graduate, serving the Lord, going into ministry, going into an occupation to be a testimony for the Lord. You know, a pastor gets to see people grow in the Lord under his ministry. Now, I don't get that because I'm a different place every week. But once in a while, God lets me see in little ways how something I did God used in someone's life and a good work. And I will tell you, just learning that is reward in itself. When I was down in Houston, Texas, and preaching a, a tour of, of the whole district, and at one service, a young lady came up, and she said, you don't know me, but she said, many years ago, she said, I was in North Little Rock, Arkansas. She said, uh, I visited the church because a girl, one of the teenage girls in our high school invited me to come, and she said, that was the Sunday you were preaching, and you preached on evangelism, and she said, God got a hold of my heart, and she said, I started immediately to witness to people, and she said, I was every Sunday bringing people from my high school to church, and they were receiving the Lord, and she said, that's been my lifestyle ever since, and I married a man, and he's got the same lifestyle I do, and she said, we just planted a church here, and we have more than 200 people, and we've led the, every one of them personally to the Lord by going door to door in the neighborhoods, and I'm going to tell you, that was a reward right now in this life. But one of the most rewarding happened this year. You see, many years ago, I already told you I was youth pastor at First Assembly in Des Moines, and I was asked by someone if we would be willing to take a teenage girl into our home. She'd become pregnant. She wasn't serving the Lord, but she had agreed to go full term, have the child, and put it up for adoption, but she needed somewhere to live. And so Ruth and I prayed about it, and we welcomed them into our home, and she lived with us for eight months, had the baby. That was more than 30 years ago. And we totally lost track of her. And you know, on Facebook, just a few months ago, I got a private message from that girl. She said, you may not remember me, and I wanted to go, I sure do remember. I wondered what happened to you. And she said, you know, I received Jesus as my Savior because you welcomed me into your home. And she said, after I had the baby and I graduated from high school, she said, I went to North Central Bible College where God prepared me for ministry. And she said, when my son was old enough and every, as you know, any adopted child, I think it's when they reach 18, have the right to know their birth parents. And she said, I got to know my son and here's a picture of me and my 30-year-old son. Both of us are serving Jesus because you opened our home, your home, and let me live with you for eight months. I don't need anything in heaven to pay me back. I got the reward now. Are you with me? We get the reward now of the joy of seeing what God does when we're just obedient when he opens doors of opportunity. Every good work is rewarded. We're rewarded. And I close just with one more testimony. I've had the privilege on a number of occasions in preaching what is the largest church in the world, Yoido Full Gospel Church in Seoul, Korea. Last I checked, which was just last year, they had more than 820,000 members, not counting the children. Their Sunday services are 75,000 in each service, seven services of 75,000 each, and they ask the church members to attend just one Sunday per month to leave room for the visitors. You wanna know what the expansion of facilities is about at New Hope? It's to make room for people. It's that simple. And by the way, one of they, they were pioneers in, in life groups, small groups, Carrie, and you know, by the way, 80% of their life groups are led by women which is revolutionary in Korea. And one of those life groups in Incheon started to grow, and it kept growing, so they just spun it off as its own church. 
Last time I was at that church in Incheon, which grew out of one cell group, they had 120,000 members. That's how God's multiplied that ministry. But I go back many years, the first time, the first time that I preached in Yoido Full Gospel Church, and Pastor Cho said, I want you to preach the early service. How many know what time is the early service? Here, eight o'clock, right? Be honest, it's just family here. How many of you just couldn't get it up and make it to the eight o'clock? That's why you're here, okay? You know what the early service is in Yoido Church? 6 a.m. First to seven services, 6 a.m. And so Pastor Cho told me, and this was many years ago, he said, now, he said, our early service doesn't have as many people but he said, I want you to preach the early service because that's when all of our cell group leaders and our other church leaders attend and I want them to hear you. And I said, well, that's, that's fine. I, I said, how many do you think will be there? He said, only about 30,000. I said, that's all right, I don't mind, I'm okay with that. So anyway, and I will tell you, along with the church leaders are a lot of little old ladies and they all sit in this section right here and I wish you could see them pray. Do you know that especially when they pray for their family members in North Korea that don't know Jesus and they rock back and forth in their pews like this and the prayers literally when they are praying is so loud it sounds when you've got 75,000 in that case 30,000 people when 30,000 people are praying out loud it literally sounds like a waterfall. That's just what it sounds like and they have a bell on the pulpit and when it's time to stop praying, they ring the bell, otherwise they wouldn't hear the voice of the guy, the guy leading the service. So they ring the bell, and then all of a sudden the prayer stops, okay? Then they move on with the rest of the service. And they were rocking back and forth, these old ladies in this section, and I was looking at one after the other, and I thought to myself, I wonder if it was her, I wonder if it was her, I wonder if it was her. The reason was I was wondering if one old lady was one of the ladies there because I had asked Pastor Cho, I, when I looked at that huge church, seated 25,000 in the main sanctuary and 50,000 in the overflow sanctuaries, I said, Cho, surely this was not all built with American money. He said, no American money. Poor Korean people gave to build this church. And he told me how they had sacrificed Many of the Koreans had sold their homes, given the equity from their homes to build the build, church building and moved into apartments. Others who lived in apartments and had no equity had their utilities cut off, their electricity, went to bed in the wintertime with no heat, no lights, and piling clothing on top of themselves to keep warm while they slept. He told me of one woman whose husband was a Buddhist who would check her purse every time there was church to ensure his wife had no money in her purse to give. And building fund Sunday like this is today. She came down with her purse and her friend. She opened her purse. She didn't have money, but she had a scissors and a folded up newspaper. And she handed the scissors to her friend, undid her hair, and her beautiful black hair fell down to her waist. She'd grown it over many years and she gave the scissors to her friend and her friend cut her hair off right at the head, took her hair, gave it to the woman and she rolled up her own hair in the newspaper and handed it to Pastor Cho and said, this can be sold to the wig factory and give the money to build the church. And the church was going up, the walls were up, Roof was partway on, and inflation hit Korea. The Korean won their currency plummeted in value, and the money was eaten up so fast, the machinery stopped. They were two weeks away from foreclosure on the property. Cho called the congregation at that time, and the first sanctuary just seated 10,000. And it was the first sanctuary, and he called them together, and he put a table in the front, and he read them the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And he said, if you will just give what you have, like this boy gave the loaves and the fish, God will multiply it as Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fish and the need will be met. And he invited them to come give on the table. 12,000 people stood packed in on the dirt floor of that unfinished church and nobody moved because they all had the same idea 
the little bit I have left is not going to make enough difference to count. But God counts more than we do, less than we do, and differently than we do. One person responded. An old woman made her way to the front. Cho had visited her in her home. She was a widow with no children. She lived on a monthly government welfare stipend, just enough for food. And she lived in a little shack in a ghetto on the edge of Seoul. He said her house was made from cast off plywood and sheet metal from building sites when they'd finished the buildings. And she scavenged those and put this little shack together. Cho said, when I went inside, I could not stand up. It was that small. My head would hit the ceiling. And she was holding in her hands a dented brass rice bowl, a pair of chopsticks, and a spoon. She walked forward to Pastor Cho, and she bowed and hand, handed the rice bowl out, and she said, Pastor, I want to give these to Jesus. Cho said, I thought of the little hovel where she lived. And I said, Mother, which is the Korean way of a, a man addressing an older woman. And he said, Mother, this is all you have, isn't it? And she said, yes. And you can understand, Cho. He said, I cannot accept this. The woman fell to her knees. And she began to cry. And she looked up and through her tears said to her pastor, Pastor, I can eat my food from a cardboard box with my fingers. But do you tell me poor people cannot give to Jesus? Joe said the Holy Spirit spoke to him. I have chosen the foolish things to confound the wise and the weak to confound the mighty that no flesh will glory in my presence. He reached out, took the rice bowl from the woman, put his hand on her head, closed his eyes and prayed and he said, I prayed, God, I told this woman you would multiply what she brought. I pray you honor her obedience. He opened his eyes one more person had come. He was a Korean businessman in a tailor-made suit. And the businessman said, Pastor, I need a rice bowl. Will the church sell that rice bowl? Joe said, yes. The man took out his check book, wrote out a check, handed it to Pastor Cho. Cho told me personally. I looked down at the check. It was equivalent in Korean money at that time of more than 30,000 U.S. dollars. The man took the rice bowl. Cho took the check. And the man turned to the congregation and he held up the rice bowl and he said, this is the most expensive rice bowl I have ever had. I want to give this rice bowl to the church. And he turned and he bowed and gave it to Pastor Cho. And then he turned and said, does anyone else need a rice bowl? Someone came and bought it, oh, not for 30000 They bought it and gave it back. Someone else came and bought it and gave it back. And soon they stopped exchanging the rice bowl. They took rings off, watches off, emptied their pockets, piled it on the table. And the next Monday, this was on a Saturday, on Monday the machinery started up and never stopped until the church was finished. Steve, would you show that little clip? I want you to see that this is just the inner main sanctuary, the first sanctuary that was built, that was finished because of the obedience of one widow woman giving all she had. God counts more than we do. God counts differently than we do. Lord Jesus, you know each one of us. God, there are so many stories here of people who are here because of the good works of someone else who invited them or brought them. Lord, we're all the result of someone's good works. 
And God, we pray for them. We know you recorded it. We pray for their reward to be great. Would you just in this moment pray for people that, whose good works are why you're here, for God to reward them. Lord, I just thank you. Someone's here because someone invited them or because they were just driving down the road and decided to stop. And they may be like Eunice. They've never received you as Savior, Jesus. They may be like Peter in Amsterdam who served you at one time but have turned away. Lord, in either of these cases, you want to welcome them into your arms today. Before pastor comes with heads bowed and eyes closed, right where you are in your seat, salvation isn't easy, but it is incredibly simple. The word says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right where you are, you can do that. And whether you're like Eunice in London or like Peter in Amsterdam, you need Jesus this morning. I'd like to pray for you before a pastor comes. Would you just lift a hand and say, Randy, I need Jesus in my life for the first time or back in my life again. And I will pray with you right where you are. Just hold your hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Someone else? Thank you back there. You say, someone might see my hand. What's more important is God sees your hand. God will hear your prayer. And if it'll help you, I'll lead you in a prayer. It's your prayer he wants to hear. But I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Now, you've got to mean the words. You can't just repeat them after me. But, and I'm going to ask the rest of the congregation, would you join these that lifted their hands? And would you pray with them so they're not praying alone? Just pray after me. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing me here today. Forgive my sins. Take control of my life. I want to live for you because you died for me. Thank you because I know you've heard my prayer. You have forgiven me and you're giving me a new life, an everlasting life. In Jesus' name. Would you just thank the Lord for those of me that decision as pastor comes?